excuse me one moment, I'll need to... Can everybody hear me okay if I leave it on there? Is that okay? Um, I need to be able to turn my notes over and use the clicker at the same time, so... Um, sure, I think you might have accidentally switched it off, sorry. Okay, everyone can hear okay? Brilliant. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, so yeah, my name's Stuart Garner, I'm the Operations Manager for Norwich Museums, which is part of um, Norfolk Museum Service, um, which is part of Norfolk County Council. Um, <coughs> we're a regional museum service, just to give you a bit of an introduction, um, consisting of 10 museums across Norwich, uh, sorry, across Norfolk, sorry, um, and I represent the Norwich Museums, um, which is Norwich Castle Museum, Art Gallery, Strangers Hall and the Museum of Norwich. Um, I specifically wanted to talk about weddings uh, at Norwich Museums and, and just give you an idea of some of the things that we've done with regards to weddings, um, but also the challenges um, and opportunities that we've faced. Um, and also kind of to discuss sort of really some of the initiatives that we've pursued. I know that some of you here will probably do weddings at your own venues, um, and I appreciate that all museums and, and, and heritage sites are slightly different. Some have better spaces that are more predisposed to weddings than others, but um, this is sort of just to talk about what we did using probably lovely but slightly awkward spaces. Um, so first and foremost, why did we want to look at weddings in the first place? Well, obviously the, the honest answer is, is because of funding pressures. Um, the need for looking at additional funding streams. Um, we're obviously in an unprecedented period um, of austerity. Um, we're all feeling the pinch of that, um, and we need to try and offset some of those cuts in funding with supplementary income streams. But also to utilise our beautiful and historic buildings in different ways. Um, they're assets um, that we need to utilise to their full potential. Also to expand upon our existing um, and growing corporate hire um, venue uh, hire offer, um, we've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years on, on expanding that side of the, of the service. Um, to put it into context, um, last September we had more corporate hires than we had for the whole of the previous financial year, and that was just down really to sort of putting the message out there about what we had and what we could offer. Um, and the business actually has started to take after itself, so doing weddings was really the natural progression on the back of that. Um, but also, the ability that I think to offer something unique, um, and that is to offer weddings um, at a venue that people can have a personal connection with. Um, most of our visitors attended our museums from a very young, early age, and then continue to come back. Lots of people have a certain uh, collection um, or part of the, the museums that they can associate with, um, and that connection we felt was important. <coughs> So what did we do? Um, well, first of all, we identified the museums and the areas within the museums um, that we could hold weddings. Um, and in our case, Strangers Hall and Norwich Castle. I mentioned um, the Museum of Norwich at the Bridewell also within the initial list. We actually discounted that in the end because um, we needed to assess whether we could hold them. And unfortunately, because it was a quite small spaces with static collections, it, it really didn't lend itself well. Um, Norwich Castle and Strangers Hall, however, did. Um, we then looked at the viability of weddings within the museums, um, and when we talk about viabilities, um, that also means assessing the impact it would have on our general museum visitor. Um, I'd like to emphasise that we're a museum first and a wedding venue second, I think that's really important. Museum visitors for us as a museum service will always be our core offer, it's always our core business. So weddings need to supplement that core offer, um, but not take over or affect it, because that's our real bread and butter. Um, we also looked at when we could accommodate weddings, and I think that's also important because for us, we realised that we could only actually accommodate weddings out of hours. We couldn't accommodate them during the day because it would have that impact on the visitor. Um, so, as an example, at Strangers Hall Museum, we used to open on a Wednesday and a Saturday. Well, predominantly, weddings need to happen on a Saturday because that's when most people want to get married. So we actually took a bit of a risk and we changed the opening day from a Saturday to a Sunday to the general museum visitor. Actually, it worked really well because what it meant was is that we took that risk, but we didn't see a reduction in overall visitor numbers over weekends. But it allowed us to accommodate weddings and make the supplemental income. And in fact, three, four times as much income as we would have done had we had been open to the museum visitor. Um, and then we obviously applied for wedding licenses once we had decided where um, we were going to host the wedding. Um, the, we then started work on a profit and loss study for weddings to determine what we should charge and realistic profits. 
Um, again, that wasn't really an easy, it's, it, we, we work in corporate hire all the time, but weddings, it would appear, is kind of a, um, a, a different field altogether. And generally, I always thought you could put, well, when I am planning now to get married, that you can put an extra couple of digits on anything associated <laughs> with weddings. Um, but um, yeah, we did some work on that. Um, and we decided, actually, that we can only cater for simple ceremonies in the absence of specific internal wedding expertise. I mean, we are all museum professionals at the end of the day, we're not wedding planners. And that is a very, very specific um, area of expertise. So finally, we decided that we would outsource full wedding packages um, to an external provider. So we would still do small ceremonies ourselves, but if somebody wanted a full shebang wedding, then, then we would outsource that. In our case, we used a company called Event House. Um, now, Event House are a uh, company based local to Norwich um, that specialise in sort of high end events, really, balls, banquets, um, and large scale events and weddings. Um, so, yeah, we got in contact with Event House along with some other people and looked at the, you know, what they could offer, um, and they were the ones that we went with. So, the benefits of using a third party provider is, first of all, obviously, they have the expertise, the expertise that we lacked. Right. Um, they also have all of the wedding associated equipment and resources. Now again, that's important because weddings require an awful lot of specific kit. And even then if you've purchased it, you need somewhere to store it afterwards. So um, by outsourcing it, they had all of the, the, the kit and could bring it in. They do all of the liaising with the couple surrounding meeting their expectation. Now again, anybody that's either been married, um, or as a man, I'm, I'm you know, acutely aware, um, being a fiancé, that, that you know, there are high expectations that need to be met. Um, <laughs> seriously, trust me. Um, but also, they take all of the risk, um, the financial risk, that is. Um, we operate whereby, with the third party provider, um, the couple's liaise is direct with the provider, um, they contact us to establish if we are available or not as a venue, um, and then we charge them a deposit which is, needs to be paid there and then, basically, which is non-refundable. So the, the risk is actually with Event House, not with us, if it falls through. Um, also, they do all their own marketing, um, which includes upselling our venues. So um, that's fantastic, because our historic buildings that we're using are being upsold in all of the glossy wedding magazines, um, trade shows associated with weddings, on a regular basis. So it's putting our name out there. We spoke about the benefits of using a third party, but I should also cover some of the risks. Um, first and foremost, obviously, our reputation is at stake. We are effectively putting our reputation in the hands of a third party provider. Um, whether it's at Norwich Castle or Strangers Hall, if it goes bad, all people see is Strangers Hall and Norwich Castle, not Event House. Um, so which is why that initial work, um, and there's lots of initial work, setting up contracts and agreeing limitations of use is ever so important, because we need to be absolutely sure that it's not going to reflect badly on us. There's also the risks to the buildings um, and to the collections themselves. Um, weddings, obviously, um, generally are associated with alcohol and dancing and music, which then leads on to vibrations. So there's obvious risk to the collections um, and, and the buildings. So that needs to be assessed. Um, and again, ground rules set very early on so that there's um, you know, the level of expectation from the happy couple um, that they are well informed at the point of when they book. Um, but also, there's less profit margin for Norfolk Museum Service. Um, but I will emphasise that the cost of sale remains minimal for us in terms of what we are actually putting up. Um, I just want to show you a few photos now of just some of our weddings and some of the transformations that the third party provider has been able to do for us as an example of how, with a bit of expertise, they can transform um, venues into something quite beautiful. Um, so first of all, Strangers Hall. Um, if any of you have ever been there, this is the great hall within Strangers Hall. Uh, Strangers Hall is a medieval house that was a home to um, mayors, magnates and merchants. Um, and dates back to the early 14th century. It's one of the oldest buildings um, or houses um, in Norwich. This is the Great Hall, and you can see it's been set up. This was actually for a wedding um, with a very sort of medieval-esque kind of banquet style um, set up. Now, generally within there, it looks very, very different, and they've also put a bar in the corner, as you can see. So, um, you know, it's a lovely, lovely venue. Um, there's another one photo here of the Great Hall and the staircase, which is a fantastic wedding opportunity. Um, this is the Georgian dining room, which is where most of the ceremonies take place. And this photo is actually of the Georgian dining room before it's been um, transformed into a wedding uh, ceremony room. The reason I'm just showing this is to show you that obviously all that furniture there needs to be moved. The more times you move the furniture, the, more, the, the, the higher risk there is that something's going to get damaged. And, and also some of it requires technical expertise from our conservation department. 
Um, so once it is moved, um, it's a lovely venue, um, as you can see. Um, transforms very, very well. All of the chairs and everything is supplied by the third party provider. We got that down to a T by doing, by the way, that moving of furniture. Um, we did a few dry runs, and now we've got it down to now we'll do it in about an hour and a half. Um, and so actually, in terms of the cost in staffing, it's three members of staff for an hour and a half is not too bad. Again, that's all part of the viability. Um, Frenzel also has a beautiful uh, garden. It's a bit of an oasis um, in the uh, central business district of Norwich. You wouldn't know it's there until after. Sorry, I'm getting so I've got to move on quickly. Um, but again, um, it's a beautiful breakout space, as you can see. Um, we also have the Undercroft at Strangers Hall. Again, uh, it's a bit of a slightly awkward space that you can um, quite easily turn into um, a good music venue there um, for the weddings. Um, it's also very good because we spoke earlier about vibrations and alcohol. Well, being a, a medieval stone undercroft, there's not much in there that can be broken. So it's <laughs> ideal. Um, and in terms of vibrations as well, it's fine. So, um, but again, it's an awkward space that, that you know, with a bit of imagination, is, it lends itself very well to that purpose. Um, a ghost. This was taken... It's not a very good photo on there, actually, but uh, um, this was taken at our last wedding by a professional photographer. The reason I've just put it on there is also just to explain that, um, that we actually have also branched into um, doing paranormal events at Strangers Hall, uh, something we never used to do, um, and, uh, but, but actually there's, there's a real good market for it. And quarterly now we have paranormal event companies come in. Um, so, but also, it adds to the intrigue of the building, which is, again, why it's suitable for, for, for wedding events. Um, then on to Norwich Castle, um, just very quickly, so I can look at it. Uh, Norwich Castle, um, I'm sure most of you are aware of it, at least I hope you are, um, is an 11th century um, stone Norman keep and castle, commissioned by William the Conqueror in 1067. Um, and again, um, this is one of our Coleman art galleries, which with a bit of uh, transformation turns itself very well into a ceremony room. Um, this is the Castle Keep, which is kind of the jewel in the crown of Norfolk Museum Service. Again, it's a beautiful, slightly awkward open space, um, and can be used um, for, again, medieval-esque um, wedding venue, which, again, is, I think, you know, is beautiful. Um, all of the trestle tables and things are supplied by the third-party provider. Again, um, there's an example of the type of food they provide. It's very much um, sort of medieval banquet-style food. Um, it's fantastic. Um, and also Norwich Castle Rotunda, which again is a very awkward space, and it's hard. This is the central area of Norwich Castle Museum, um, and you can see all the different galleries and areas that, that go off it. It's a bit like the centre of a wheel with all the galleries going off. Very, very awkward space. But Event House managed to look beyond what it is, and actually by putting some drapes around the outside to cover the doors and using some simple frames, they actually managed to turn it into a beautiful space by closing off, as you can see, seeing all of that which is beyond. Um, and actually turned it into a fantastic fine dining area for a wedding. So again, it's just having that expertise. We couldn't see that. They came in and saw that because that's what they do. Um, and then um, this is our benefactor's room, which um, Steve actually did um, some, some good work on this. But what we've actually done is we got in contact with the registry office team in Norwich, or actually they got in contact with us, because they needed to get out of the premises that they're currently in. We need to make additional income, so we came together and actually now, all as of 1st of April, all registry office weddings in Norwich are going to be taking place from Norwich Castle. So what we've done is, is we actually, we, we, as it, it's such a joint partnership in fact, that we're getting a percentage of every booking that they have at Norwich Castle. So that's the arrangement. So we grow with their success. So again, it's just another example of how they're saving money by coming to us. It's actually financially they're better off by coming to us. Um, but what it means is people can now get married in a beautiful, nationally iconic building. Um, and um, so it's a win-win for everyone. And in fact, since they've moved over, or it's been publicised and moved over to us, their bookings have increased by 200. And this is only since just before Christmas when they announced it. So it was a very shrewd idea by Steve to actually charge them for individual weddings and not just a flat hire fee. So I commend Steve for that. Um, so just very quickly, in summary, because I know I've gone over, um, what I would suggest um, is that you choose your venue and rooms carefully, consider when you can cater for weddings, um, assess the risk to your collections, buildings, and most importantly, visitor experience, um, consider whether or not you have the capacity to not only cater for weddings, but also the lengthy to and fro planning stage with the couple, um, and I can't overstate that, um, and um, by using third-party providers can mean you limit the profit made from a wedding by approximately 50%, but you do eliminate 90% of the work while still building a steady increase in business. So um, that's all from me. Thank you.